When we look out at the world, can we trust the information we gain through our senses? Aristotle said that yes, we can, and that our senses and reason work together to tell us about reality. Later on in the Enlightenment modernity, René Descartes said that we should doubt our senses because they may be deceived. John Locke, on the other hand, said that everything that we learn comes through our senses and that we can trust them, but that Reason is really just an extension of what we learn through our senses. So reason and sense experience have become separate and competing theories rather than working together. Later on, Immanuel Kant initiates postmodernism by saying that we cannot even speak about reality at all because all of the information we gain about reality through our senses can be doubted and may be deceived. We cannot know the thing in itself, because all we can know are the appearances that we have in our mind. Therefore, metaphysics cannot discover or talk about reality. The best we can do is talk about the appearances in our own mind. Let's see what Immanuel Kant has to say. Let's talk about Immanuel Kant's epistemology. First we'll look at his epistemology and how it's between rationalism and empiricism. Then we'll ask, is metaphysics possible according to Kant? And then we'll investigate cause and effect and the possibility of the physical sciences. In the Enlightenment, debate raged over whether knowledge primarily comes from reason, as the rationalists said, or from the senses, as the empiricists said. Immanuel Kant, who was born from in 1724 and lived until 1804, analyzes these and attempts to combine rationalism and empiricism, keeping the good and rejecting the bad. As we will see, what Kant comes up with is very different than Aristotle's combination of observation and reason. It is important to note that he is highly influenced by David Hume's empiricism, who he also critiques. He says that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumbers, from his uncritical belief in the prior way of doing philosophy. So just like René Descartes before him, Immanuel Kant is rejecting all of the ways of doing philosophy before him, and he's starting from scratch and reinventing the wheel to see what he can come up with with his own system of philosophy. How does Kant agree or disagree with empiricism and rationalism? Here's a brief sketch. Kant agrees that all knowledge begins with sense experience. Mental concepts without sense perception are empty. That is to say, that mental concepts point to the items of our sense perception. And if we don't have sense perception to talk about, our mental concepts are empty concepts. Reason cannot give us sure knowledge of reality. So reason is doubtful. We can doubt our reason. Here are some things that Kant disagrees with. Kant disagrees that all knowledge arises from sense experience. He would say that this is not true. What is the difference between knowledge arising from sense experience and knowledge beginning with sense experience? We'll see that here in a minute. Also, Kant disagrees that abstractions cannot be known. In fact, he does assert that abstractions can be known. Empiricism says that reality can be known through the senses. Kant will deny this and say that we cannot know reality. What's that mean, that we cannot know reality? We'll see in a minute. Rationalism says, and Kant agrees, that knowledge requires some innate ideas, that sense perception without mental concepts is blind, that senses cannot give us sure knowledge of reality. But rationalism also says some things that Kant disagrees with. Knowledge begins with innate ideas. In fact, Kant will deny this because he says that knowledge begins with sense experience, not with the innate ideas. Reality can be known through reason. As we've already said, reality cannot be known in Kant. Now here's a summary of some affirmations. Kant says all knowledge begins with sense experience, that knowledge requires both innate mental concepts and sense experience working together. You can see how he's trying to bring rationalism and empiricism back together. 
Universals can be known, but they require particulars. Reality as the thing in itself cannot be known. We cannot know the nature of objects as they are in themselves. Therefore, we can only talk about appearances, not reality. What does that mean? Kant says that all knowledge begins with sense experience. He says, There can be no doubt that all our knowledge begins with experience. For how would our faculty of knowledge be awakened into action unless the objects affecting our senses produced representations and also aroused the activity of our understanding to compare these representations? He also says that not all knowledge arises from sense experience. He says, although all our knowledge begins with experience, it does not follow that it all arises out of experience. All learning comes from reflection on appearances, which are produced by sensory experience. So first, we sense things with our five senses and create an appearance and experience in our mind. And all learning comes from reflecting on our experience. But when we reflect on these appearances, the knowledge that we learn, that we gain, does not necessarily come from the appearances. It may be that the appearances awoke something that was already in us. This means that some knowledge, like 5 plus 7 equals 12, begins with the senses but arises from reason. There is no knowledge independent of experience. There are two conditions for knowledge, he says. Kant says thoughts without content are empty, and intuitions without concepts are blind. So first we have intuition, which is the ability to produce an appearance in the mind based on sense impression. So the intuition process goes like this. We get sensory data. We see things. We feel things. We hear things. And this creates in our mind an appearance. And then we have con a concept. These are categories of the mind that help us understand. This is what turns an appearance into an object of understanding. Concepts enable the process of understanding. So that from an appearance, we can actually understand what it is that we're looking at. Because we know something already. He says it is only through them that experience becomes possible. Otherwise, a perceiver could not distinguish separate experiences, but only exist as a stream of consciousness that is not self-conscious. So what does this mean? This means that when we sense things, think of an infant right when they're born. Their eyes do not lock on to anything. Um, they, their eyes just kind of swim around and they're not really looking at anything. That's because they cannot distinguish between different objects. It's just a bunch of random colors before their eyes. It takes a long time for them eventually to be able to organize this sense data into an appearance of different objects and to separate different objects or to be aware uh, when one event stops and another event starts. That organization of sense data into an appearance, it, it takes intuition and concepts. Concepts in our mind help us organize these sensory data into the objects that we see. You can think of it like this as well, because there's a pure element and an empirical element. So pure intuition is a precondition of experience, like space and time. Right? We're already aware innately, as soon as we can reason, of space and time. Um, this is required for us to even be able to learn anything from our sensory experience. Right? Pure intuition. Empirical intuition is sensations of attributes. So intuition lets us distinguish between red and uh, purple, or between warm and cold, or hard and soft, or stinky and fragrant. Right? It helps us. Uh, it helps us distinguish between different attributes in our sensation. Then we talk about concepts. What's a pure concept? This is an abstract category, like straight, 
or cause, or substance, or God, or the soul. We have empirical concepts, and the empirical application of these concepts allows the perception of objects, like, oh, that's a cherry pie, or an otter, or water, or sun. So we have a concept in our mind that informs the sensory data so that when we look out at the world, we don't have to stop and think what we're looking at. We just, we just see the cherry pie. So let's discuss the process of learning. We're going to keep building on the ideas that we've already presented. Kant says our knowledge springs from two fundamental sources of the mind. First is sensibility, or receptivity of sensory data, which is the capacity of receiving representations, the ability to receive impressions. This converts sen raw sensory data into phenomena, or appearances. Next we have understanding, which is the power to know an object through these representations. It is a spontaneity in the production of concepts. It receives and store knowledge. You might also think of this as a as the process by which we remember. We learn something and now it is stored in our memory. This includes spontaneity, the ability to think of that object at will. Let's look at the capacities of the rational mind. We take these two steps and actually extend them out to three and look at them in some more detail. We have sensibility understanding and reasoning. We've already talked about sensibility and understanding a little bit. The process of learning goes in this direction, from right to left, Sen starting with sensibility, going to understanding, and then reasoning. So sensibility is that process by which objects are given. So we sense objects. We see objects. We don't just see random colors but we can actually distinguish when one object ends and another one begins. We're not like infants who uh, cannot tell what they're looking at. Rather, when we look out at the world, we just see objects. We don't have to stop and think about it. We just automatically do see objects. And this is through the use of our intuition. But intuition, as we've stated, can have an empirical aspect and a pure aspect. Pure aspect gives us ideas like space and time, which are a prerequisite for even being able to distinguish objects or events. And empirical, like blue or warm or soft, things like that. And then an understanding. Understanding is, the, is that by which objects are thought. So not only do we perceive that an object that a computer is in front of us, but we also can now think about a computer without looking at it. We can close our eyes and still think about computer. So understanding is that by which objects are thought via concepts. Concepts that we already have innately in our mind help us make sense of the appearances, organizing them into thoughts. In the empirical sense, now we go from blue and warm and soft to things like ball and water and sun and cat. In a pure sense, we have uh, concepts of causality and substance and math. These are pure concepts that help us distinguish that the ball is a different object from the water. And then in reasoning, we take these thoughts and now we can reason with them. And so we're attempting to think about concepts as they are in themselves. Can we think about causality, pure and simple, or things like this? So reasoning is that by which we strive to think the unconditioned. This is through pure reason, and it's pure only. There's no empirical sense. So we try to think of God or soul or the concept of reality, these abstract things. We try to think of them as they are in themselves. And Kant says these are ultimately unknowable in themselves. We cannot know them because we are only thinking of them through reflection and not even, uh, not even in reference to sensory data. So it already starts to become an empty kind of concept. But also, the only way we can think of these things is because we are, we are using 
ideas that we gain from sensory experience. And we never, even at the beginning, we never really knew about objects as they are in themselves. All we know is um, what our eyes tell us or what our nose tells us. But maybe, you know, we have five senses, but maybe there are 12 possible senses out there. So we don't know objects as they are in themselves. We only know them in reference to our five senses. And even those are rather limited. Dogs can hear more better than we can. Eagles can see better than we can. Now let's talk about whether metaphysics is possible. Let's just dig deeper into Kant's uh, philosophy of mind. So the stages of learning are sensation, then understanding, then reason, as we just stated. All knowledge is of appearances, not reality in itself. Sensory data is converted into understanding by the use of innate concepts in the mind. This is a little bit of review. Uh, without these, sensation cannot be converted into individual experiences. These fundamental concepts are divided into 12 categories that are a priori preconditions for experience. Remember, a priori means uh, a type of reasoning or a type of knowledge that is not dependent upon experience. A priori knowledge is required prior to experience, but it only comes to our attention through translating sensation into an appearance or experience. We'll continue to talk about what that means. We cannot know reality in itself and only know the world as it appears to us, as organized by our innate a priori concepts. Can we do metaphysics? If we can't know reality in itself, then can we even do metaphysics? Because metaphysics attempts to say things about reality and to study reality as it is in itself. Metaphysics is the most abstract uh, area of philosophy that, start, that tries to study things like reality and being and existence. Can we even do those things if we cannot know reality in itself? Kant says no if we seek knowledge of reality in itself. We cannot do metaphysics. But we can do metaphysics when we say that the role of metaphysics is to investigate the 12 categories of all priori concepts, which are preconditions for experience. So it's a very limited kind of area of metaphysics. So what are these 12 categories? These 12 categories allow us to categorize and organize raw sensory data into meaningful appearances, experiences, and ultimately ideas. Without these, we cannot have experiences or gain knowledge. So contrary to John Locke, who says that we are born tabula rasa, a blank slate, knowing nothing, John Locke says that all of our knowledge comes from senses, that all of our concepts and ideas came from the senses. But Kant is saying that we cannot learn anything from raw sensory data unless we already have certain categories in our mind that help us organize this raw data into intelligible ideas. So here's the 12 categories plus two conditions. So he organizes these into, uh, we have four columns here. When we talk about quantity, we can talk about unity or plurality or uh, totality, which is wholeness, wholeness versus parts. So we have one, we have many, uh, and we have whole versus parts. And then in terms of quality, we can talk about reality. We have a concept that reality is out there, that we're trying to learn about reality. We talk about reality right now. So that concept is a category of the mind. And the idea of negation, that not only do we have uh, affirmation, we also have negation. This allows for uh, propositions that may be true or false. And then limitation, finitude versus infinitude. Right? I, we know that we are limited in our knowledge, or we know that um, a cup is limited in space, and that's why I can pick it up. If it was unlimited in space, then it would be, it would be infinitely large.
but it has limitation. Objects have limitation. And I already know that from this innate a priori category. In terms of relation, we have substance and accent. So when we ask, what is it? You can say, well, this is an object that is lightweight. You can hold it in your hand, and it's used to hold water. That's called a cup. That's the substance, the essential qualities of a cup. Uh, if, if it's not a certain shape, then it's no longer a cup. And if it's too heavy, or I can't drink out of it, then it's not really going to fulfill its purpose as a cup. But accidental qualities might be the color. If it's blue, or if it's green, or if it's yellow, it's still a cup. So the relationship between substance and accident, or uh, essential qualities and accidental qualities. That relation is a category we are born with, with innate knowledge and a priori understanding. We already know how to distinguish between those kinds of traits, and that is how it's only because we have that kind of knowledge already that we can learn. And causality. So cause and effect. I know one thing happens and it leads to another thing. And this happens over and over again. And I can anticipate, I can act, I can respond. I can have something like morality. Cause and effect. And then interaction between things. So one thing comes up against and in contact with another thing. And the second thing moves. All right? I know that movement happens because one thing touches another thing. Interaction. Modality. All right? So these are modes in which something can exist. So possibility, and then existence, and necessity. So something can exist, or I can think of something not existing. Or possibility, versus impossible. And then necess necessity, versus potentiality, you might say. And behind all of these are two primary conditions of space and time. Space and time, these innate ideas of space and time, underlie all of these other 12 categories. So they're sort of more fundamental conditions. So all 12 of these categories, plus those two conditions, are required as innate ideas before we can ever make sense of our sensory data, before we can ever learn anything. We already do have these innate concepts in our mind. So how do these 12 categories fit into Kant's broader process of learning from sensory experience? So here is Kant's overall theory of knowledge. First we talk about uh, the noumena. That's an important term. The noumena. That's reality. That's the thing in itself that is ultimately unknowable. I don't know the nature of the thing in itself. We have light coming off of it and touching our eyes, uh, and we can see or we can feel whatever the sensory data is. We have five senses, and this gives us raw sensory data. It's unorganized and nonsensical. It's just a kaleidoscope of colors. It's not even objects. It's not even shapes. It's nothing. It's not even a distinction between this color and that color. So we can't even say that it is a bunch of random colors. All we can say is that sight is happening, because we cannot distinguish between colors, because we haven't done anything yet. All we have is raw sensory data. There's an important break here, because we are not yet even talking about mind, and we cannot get outside of our own mind. We cannot think about what is outside of our own mind, because whenever we try to think about reality as it is in itself, all we're doing is thinking about thoughts. When we talk about reality, we're talking about a thing called reality, a concept called reality, which is in our mind. So whenever we talk about anything, we're talking about something else that's in our mind. And so we cannot actually gain direct access to reality as it is in self. Anything that we know, anything that we say, anything that we think, is directed toward other thoughts. So we are, in a sense, trapped in our own minds. 
and unable to make connection with reality as it is in itself. So then from this raw sensory data, we have a phenomena. This is an appearance or experience. Because as we've already said, sensibility occurs, where intuition organizes raw data into individual appearances, objects of sensation, such as green and tall and hard. So we organize, our mind uses these innate concepts through intuition to organize this raw sensory data into uh, understanding that we see an object. We're seeing tree or we're seeing green versus purple. We're seeing an object versus lots of objects. We know where the object ends and the earth begins or the air or the sun. Next we have understanding where the 12 categories or concepts organize appearances into objects of thought. So now we can we can think about a tree without actually looking at a tree. So at first we look at something and we see tree. In that moment we just see tree. And then immediately once we think the thought tree, we have moved from step one into step two, from sensibility into understanding. Next we have reasoning, where we can attempt to think about the 12 categories. So we can not just think about ideas like tree, but we can think about thinking about ideas. So in pure reason, we have thought of the unconditioned categories in themselves, and ultimately they are unknowable. We think about thinking, we are on the verge of thinking about nothing, because we cannot fully understand uh, these categories as they are in themselves. Why? Because whenever we think of one of these categories, we have to think of examples. We cannot think about these concepts without also, in the back of our mind, having examples in mind. And examples are a memory of appearances and experience. So we can, in some sense, engage in pure reason and, and think about these concepts uh, without reference to appearance, but in doing so, we rob them of their specific content and it becomes uh, impossible to know what they are as they are in themselves. So let's simplify this. The main things to remember are noumena and phenomena, that we cannot know the noumena, and all we know is phenomena, and everything we think is they are thoughts about the phenomena. So when you think tree, you're not really thinking that that object out there in reality is tree. Rather, what you're thinking is this perception of mine is called a tree. This phenomena of mine, this appearance or experience is a tree. Not that the reality is a tree because you don't have access to reality. All you have access to is the sight or the touch or the feel which are now in your mind. Alright, so having simplified that, the two major, major divisions are the noumena, which is the thing in itself. This is reality, which is ultimately unknowable, and phenomena, which is appearances. The Twelve categories organize raw sensory data into understandable objects of thought. So conclusions from this. All thought on reason is about appearances, while reality is unknowable. Anytime we say, this is reality, we are only describing how it appears to us. So then we ask, is metaphysics possible? Because metaphysics claims to be thinking about reality, or about being, or about existence, as they are in themselves. He says no, if metaphysics aims at an objective knowledge of reality, such as uh, realism, in both uh, classical like ancient philosophy and medieval philosophy, as well as an Enlightenment philosophy. The Enlightenment philosophers like John Locke with his empiricism and Rene Descartes with his rationalism both still thought that we could have objective knowledge of reality. So that kind of metaphysics is thrown out for Kant. 
but he does say there is some small role for metaphysics left if it aims at appearances and the 12 categories, so categorizing them. This introduces phenomenology and postmodernism, that we cannot know reality, but we can know about appearances. We'll touch on the definition of phenomenology a little bit later. So how do a priori and a posteriori knowledge relate? Remember, a priori means knowledge that is not dependent upon the senses, upon experience, and a posteriori is knowledge that is dependent upon experience. Kant divides these two categories into four. So again, definitions a priori is independent of experience, a posteriori is dependent on experience. Analytic is something that is true by definition, such as everything in the predicate is already in the subject. What does that mean? For example, squares are shapes. Well, if you already understand what a square is, you already know that it's a shape. So we haven't learned anything here. We haven't said anything new. What we've done is just drawn out one aspect of square. So the predicate, shape, is already included in the subject of square. This is an analytic kind of statement, an analytic knowledge. This adds no knowledge. It only explains one aspect of what is already known. Then we have synthetic knowledge, which combines two pieces of information into a third where the predicate actually does add information. For example, my dog's name is Fido. Well, my dog could have been named Nero, or Fi uh, uh, could have been named Spot, or Odie. Could have been named something else. So I actually do give you new information when I say my dog's name is Fido, because the name is not already contained in the subject. So it's synthetic because I've taken two concepts, dog and name, and even Fido, and I and even my. Every word here is it an independent concept. And I take them and arrange them in such a way where I give new piece of information. The predicate is not already contained in the subject. Let's look at it this way, with this kind of graph. We have these four different definitions here. How do they overlap? All right, so analytic a priori knowledge are things like tautologies, identity, and definition. Tautology is just when something is true by definition. So this does not add knowledge. All right, for example, when I say all bodies are extended, this is... Uh, what Kant says, when I say all bodies are extended, I do not thereby enlarge my concept of a body in the least, but simply analyze it. Because a body, an object, a physical object, a body, uh, if I know that it's an object, if I know what a body is, I already know that it has extension, that it has size and shape. So, I have not added any new piece of information when I say bodies are extended. Another example, bachelors are unmarried men. So the, the very definition of a bachelor is that it is an unmarried man. So when I say bachelors are unmarried men, this adds no new information. All I am doing is explaining the concept I already have in my mind. So this is not two concepts. This is one concept stated with two different sets of words. Another example, roses are flowers. If I already know what a rose is, then I already know that it's a flower. So flower is contained within the concept of rose. I could also say roses are red. I could also say roses have thorns. So this is really just drawing out one aspect of what I already know, and it adds no new knowledge. This is an analytic a priori piece of knowledge. And then we have synthetic a priori. This is the most important one on this graph. Synthetic a priori is something like deduction. It adds knowledge without new experience. But since it's synthetic, 
it combines ideas into a new idea. So synthetic combines two concepts into a third without additional experience. This allows for the limited metaphysics in Immanuel Kant. For example, 7 plus 5 equals 12. I already know what 7 means, and what plus means, and what 5 means, and what equals means. I put them together and I have 12, a new concept. But I haven't gone out and counted anything, unless I am a very young child in which I have to count on my fingers or something. Um, I don't need to do another, uh, have another experience to learn 12. I just reorganize the concepts I already have in my mind, combine them into a new concept. So it's synthetic because it's combining of concepts, and it's a priori because it does not require experience. Also logic, or the statement, every event has a cause. Right? These are just items of deduction. So this is contrary to what Hume would say, because he says that cause is a mere mental habit of invention and not a synthetic a priori piece of information. Next we ask about synthetic a posteriori in the bottom right corner. This is experience. right? This is a combination of different ideas that I have learned through experience. A posteriori means it's coming from experience and synthetic means I'm adding new ideas. I'm combining them in new ways uh, together. So this does add knowledge and it adds it from experience. Right? This is knowledge of particulars. I see one cup, I see another cup, and together I start to learn what cup is, just the idea of cup. Or I have, um, you know, all kinds of ideas that are in function when I go out to my car and turn it on, right? So all kinds of particulars. Three particular cups are in front of me, and from that I can learn about the idea of cup, right? So you have different particulars that you combine in different ways, and you learn from that. For example, there are however many chairs in this room. Uh, that is synthetic a posteriori. How many chairs are in the room? Well, you count them. And every time you say another number, that is a combination, a synthetic, a synthesis of several chairs. So I have one chair, and then I have two chairs. I have synthesized, I have combined, there's two chairs into one concept, namely the concept of two chairs. And so now I have the concept of two. There are two chairs in this room. Or my dog is brown, right? So I have combined the idea of dog, which I learned about through my senses, right? I can see dog, I can feel dog, I can hear the dog. And also brown. I see the color brown in the table or in the chair or in the dog. And so now I can combine the idea of dog and brown and say my dog is brown. But I know that because I can see the dog and that it's brown. Or I have pleasure or I have pain. Right? There's I and there's pleasure and pain. So I am synthesizing different ideas and all of the ideas are based on experience. Now we talk about analytic a posteriori in the top right corner. This category is impossible because an analytic statement is one that is true by definition. So it is true so it's truth and the knowledge of an analytic statement is already in us. Something is true by definition. It's dependent upon nothing except its own definition. Like bachelors are unmarried men. A posteriori by contrast, says that a piece of knowledge is learned through experience. So which is it? Do I learn it from experience, or do I learn it because it's already innate within me? Well, it's impossible to have an analytic a posteriori piece of knowledge, because this is a contradiction. If it's true by definition, analytic, it cannot also be learned from experience. So this area is impossible. It's important to remember synthetic a priori as Kant's main contribution. This will be teased out a little more, but this is uh, very important because this is the area that allows us to combine empiricism and rationalism. It allows us to say that uh, we need to use our reason and our observation together to think about things, to learn about things. 
Regarding synthetic a priori knowledge, he says all synthetic axioms a priori are nothing more than principles of possible experience and can never be referred to things in themselves. So whenever we think of abstract concepts, they are referring to experiences and to phenomena and to memory and not to things as they are in themselves. Continuing on, he says, but only to the phenomena as objects of experience. Hence, pure mathematics, no less than pure natural science, can never refer to anything more than mere phenomena, which is an appearance, and only present that which either makes experience in general possible, or which, inasmuch as it is derived from these principles, must always be able to be presented in some possible experience. What does that mean? You cannot know the thing in itself. We only know appearances. But we know that they refer to reality. He says, a thing in itself lies at their foundation, although we do not know it as it is constituted in itself, but only its appearance. That is, the manner in which our senses are affected by this unknown something. So we cannot have sensory data unless there actually is a thing out there, a thing in itself. So we know that the thing in itself exists, even if we do not have direct access to it. And all we have access to is appearance. Accepting appearances admits also the existence of things in themselves. Mere essences of the understanding is not only admissible, but unavoidable. So we know that there's a reality out there, even if we can't know about reality. Not directly. This lays the foundation for phenomenology later developed more extensively in the 20th century. Phenomenology is the study of the structures of experience and consciousness. All right? It is anti-realism, which is to say that we cannot know about reality. The best we can do is talk about what we think about reality, the appearances, and not reality itself. So it says that a reality is beyond our ability to learn about or talk about or know for certain. We cannot know reality for certain. It is also, because of that, uh, anti-metaphysical. It, um, in the wake of, of Immanuel Kant, it becomes impossible in phenomenology to do metaphysics as the realists did in the Middle Ages and before. Also, phenomenology denies correspondence theory. Truth and meaning are social constructs of culture and tradition. So the correspondence theory says that a proposition is true if it accurately represents reality. So when I say the apple is red, that is true if, in fact, the apple actually is red. But if it's a green apple and I say the apple is red, then my statement is false. This is an example of correspondence theory. We ask whether or not my proposition actually corresponds to reality. But if we cannot actually know reality as it is in itself, we can only know how it appears, then truth is no longer subject to the correspondence theory. Rather, truth, is, truth and meaning are more like social constructs of culture and tradition. So is metaphysics possible? Again, we ask this. We've asked this several times. We ask it again. Metaphysics, he says, as a natural disposition of reason is real, but it is also in itself dialectical and deceptive. What is this? This means, deceptive means that metaphysics appears to study reality, but actually studies appearances. When he says that it is dialectical, this is to say that studying experience is subjective and not objective. He says it can never produce science, uh, but only an empty dialectical art in which one school may indeed outdo the other, but none can ever attain a justifiable and lasting success. This is to say that competing philosophies can never gain objective truth. So they can debate, but they never make real progress. Metaphysics as a study of reality is impossible except in a, a very limited synthetic a priori realm, meaning its only role is to identify the 12 categories, though it can never understand them in themselves. 
He likens classical metaphysics to astrology or alchemy, which are pseudoscience superstitions that discuss real things like planets and the 12 categories, but never say anything true or really helpful about them. Here's some philosophical influence of Kant's ideas. Uh, reality and truth now are considered mental constructs that are ultimately unknowable. Reality is just a state of consciousness. It's not something out there and objective, separate from me. When I talk about reality, it's just a state of consciousness. Though Kant affirms universals, he handicaps our ability to discover them. Real metaphysics becomes impossible. This leads to postmodernism, including the philosophies of anti-realism, skepticism, which says that you cannot know truth, you cannot know anything, because it is all beyond our ability to know anything. So we cannot know anything, and so therefore it's foolish and useless and empty to talk about truth. Existentialism, which we'll talk about soon in some later videos, nihilism and absurdism as well, and relativism uh, takes off. Here's some cultural influence from Kant. All we can know is what our senses appear to tell us. So we have the idiom, that makes sense, which replaces, that's true. All right. All we can know is what our senses appear to tell us. Today, personal experience and opinion are held as more important than reason, logic, and truth. However you interpret your life situation or events is legitimate. It's true for you because it's your reality. It's your reality. And you can perceive it however you choose. What's real for you may not be real for me. Reality and truth are treated as opinion instead of as science. Right? So when I say uh, the apple is red, I want to believe that the apple is red, but it is in fact green, then all we have is two competing opinions arguing at each other. And opinions can't be right or wrong in phenomenology. Opinions cannot be right or wrong. Of course, in classical metaphysics, yes, of course, opinion can be wrong. So let's talk about cause and effect and the possibility of science. David Hume denied the possibility of knowing causation and of doing science. Right? So causation. So we're taking one of those categories and expounding upon it as a sort of example. And this is a major debate or a major aspect of Hume's philosophy. Even though Immanuel Kant was highly influenced by Hume, Hume was a, a very strict empiricist. And so because of that, Kant disagreed with many things that Hume said. Hume denied the possibility of knowing causation and of doing science. Well, how? He was an empiricist, saying all knowledge comes through the sense experience. Experience only gives us knowledge of particulars, particular objects, not how they are connected or what they have in common. This is a denial of universals. Cause interprets the particulars as being related through a universal, because cause is a universal. Instead, Hume says cause is just a habit of expectation. We see A happen before B often. So we come to expect it, then call it a cause. We merely sense one thing happening before another. Alright, so we, we merely sense two particular events or objects, and there's no way that we can accurately and with any degree of certainty interpret those two events as being connected and judging what the cause is. We simply see the effect. We simply see things happening and we don't know cause because that is an interpretation. And the interpretation is not something that is learned through the senses. The interpretation of cause is something that comes from reason. And reason does not give us truth or knowledge in a strict empiricism. So Kant responds by saying the following. Cause is not learned from experience. It is a necessary precondition for experience. So we don't learn, we don't have an experience and then based on that we learn about cause. We reflect on the experience and then we learn about cause. Rather, we don't even have experiences unless we already have a concept of cause. 
Raw sensory data cannot be understood as an experience without cause and effect. So without this innate idea of cause in any of the other 12 categories, if we do not have those innate ideas, we can never make sense of the random kaleidoscope of colors in front of our face. So the infant that is a newborn whose eyes cannot lock on to objects and he cannot look at faces, this infant, all, all that this infant has is raw sensory data that is not organized into objects or appearances of objects or colors or anything because it cannot distinguish between the sensory data. So if we have no innate ideas, then we can never go beyond that. And Kant says raw sensory data cannot be understood as an experience without already understanding cause and effect. Without these, we would only have an unending stream of consciousness of raw sensory data and would be unable to distinguish one event from another or one object from another. When does one event end and another begin? We only know that because we already know about cause. Hume says there is nothing stopping us from considering things in different orders or in different respects. Kant responds by proving that knowledge of causation is necessary. In what order, for example, do we look at the parts of a house? From the top down or from the bottom up? All right, we can first look at the roof and then look at the whole of the house and then look at the basement later. Or we could look at it in reverse order. We could consider it in a different order, the basement and then the house and then the roof. It doesn't matter because it's an object. Take any object that's in front of you. Perhaps the computer that's in front of you. You can first consider the screen and then you can consider the keyboard or you can consider the keyboard and then you can consider the screen. You can learn about them in any order and it doesn't matter. But can we choose which order we see an event in? like a boat traveling downstream. It's first upstream, and then it is later downstream. And we just do perceive the boat being upstream before it is downstream. And we cannot, through a mere act of will, perceive it in the opposite direction. Because once it is downstream, it's upstream status is already gone and can no longer be perceived. Now that the boat is downstream, we cannot see it upstream. That's gone because that came first. So there is a necessary order here. We can't choose to view the effect before the cause. What's the difference? Well, when we consider an object, uh, the order of perception is subjective doesn't matter. We can choose the order of our perception. But an event has a necessary order of perception. You have to perceive first before you perceive second. You have to perceive cause before effect. Or rather, you have to perceive the before rather than the after. And if you only perceive the after, if you only perceive the effect, then you cannot go back in time and look at the before state. You can guess, you can think about the before state, but you cannot see it. It's already gone. There's a necessary order. And because of that, Kant says that Hume is wrong. Because there's a necessary order of cause and effect. And that cause and effect is not merely our own subjective invention, but it's a necessary perception, a precondition of perception of experience. Hume asks, how do we move from sense data to general laws, like causality? Kant says the question is invalid because having sense experience presupposes causality. Cause and effect are not subjective induction of universals, as Hume says, which is to say, cause and effect are not learned from observation of patterns. That's what induction is. Rather, they are all priori concepts necessary for sensation to be understood as an experience. They are preconditions, prerequisites, for even having an experience from the senses. The implication of this is that time and space are not learned from experience, for example. 
They are preconditions of experience, even more fundamental than 12 categories, right? Because time and space refer to, um, similarly to cause and effect. They're more broad and fundamental than cause and effect. Why is this important? It makes science possible. It verifies at least limited use of universals as a priori. Because remember, Hume said, because we can't know cause and effect, we can't really do science. Certainly not metaphysics, but at least we can now do science in Kant's view. Also, this undermines strict empiricism and verifies the necessity of reason. Right, So he's continuing to draw rationalism and empiricism back together where reason and observation work together to produce knowledge. However, Kant's philosophy also reinforces his thesis that we cannot know reality and truth. Right? This proof continues to reinforce that idea, that we cannot know reality and truth. Now let's do the write-up for Immanuel Kant's epistemology. Do you think it is possible to say what is and is not real. Why? Bernard Williams says, Our conception of the world as the object of our beliefs can do no better than repeat the beliefs we take to represent it. Can we say something about the way the world really is? Or are we unable to escape imposing our preconceived beliefs on the data? What do we mean when we say, that's your reality and you can believe it if it makes you happy? 